Thank you, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Zorine, and I welcome you to our Fragile Democracy event. We are here today thanks to the courageous leadership of Attorney General Rob Bonta, the visionary work and hospitality of Janum, the generous support of our sponsors, and a small group of committed volunteers. Josh from Florin JCL Sacramento Valley, Matthew from JCL National, Cindy and Warren from Calipaba, as well as the talented team at Janum, Jim, Joy, Colleen, Cheryl and Elizabeth, as well as my inspirational colleagues at the Attorney General's office, Kat, Maheen, Damon, James, and the members of the API Employees Advisory Committee. Please note that restrooms are on the second floor, accessible via the stairs or the elevator in the lobby. In the case of an emergency, please use the stairs. Do not use the elevator. The closest emergency exit may not be the one in which you entered. With that, let's get started. I am pleased to introduce our event MC, Amy Watanabe, the Managing Director of Client Services at Nakatomi PR, an Associate Producer for the Mineta Legacy Project. Amy is a fourth generation Japanese American whose work in community leadership is inspired by her grandparents' experience of being wrongfully incarcerated during World War II. Amy, thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here in person and those online. It is my honor to be here with you all today to discuss this important topic of the fragility of democracy and what's at stake for civil liberties and civil rights. And what more appropriate place to be gathered in community than here in the Tate Uchi Democracy Forum at the Daniel K. Inoue National Center for the Preservation of Democracy at Janum. Jim Herr, the director of the Democracy Center often shares that just outside these doors, democracy filled its people when Executive Order 9066 ordered people of Japanese ancestry here to report after being forcibly removed from their homes and taken to concentration camps across the country. As Elizabeth said in my introduction, this topic hits very close to home as I think about the racism, discrimination, and violation of civil, civil liberties that my family experienced during World War II, including being incarcerated at Tuna Canyon, Tule Lake, Minidoka, and Roar, while family members also served in the 442nd and MIS. Together with you, I am looking forward to learning from all of our esteemed guests today um, and community leaders joining today's full program. So to kick us off, it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome Bill Fujioka, Board Chair of Janum's Board of Trustees. I'll talk quickly, because I know you're all freezing right now. <laughs> The Japanese American Museum is ext extremely honored to participate and host today's event. At Janum, it's our mission to not only preserve the history of the Japanese American community, but to ensure our stories become a strong voice for the importance of social justice, civil rights, equity, and democracy. What happened to the Japanese American community at the onset of World War II must never happen again to any other community. <clears throat> Some of you have been on our campus. Some of you have toured the museum. For those who have not been here, please take the time. Go to the museum, walk upstairs, and go to Common Ground. This, this exhibit will tell the stories of an immigrant community, a typical immigrant community who came to America with the hope for a better life. But they had to suffer extreme injustice, the deprivation of the civil rights, and their liberties. This exhibit will also tell you about the Nisei soldier who fought bravely for the country and their community. Equally important, it will tell you the story of many of thousands of individuals who stood up against the injustice and fought bravely for our community's civil rights and liberties. For our community, the Japanese American community, this is ground zero where you, <clears throat> where you are. Outside in the corner, in front of the historic building where our museum was built 
is where they brought buses and they forced thousands of, of individuals of Japanese heritage <clears throat> on the buses and they took them to concentration camps in very desolate areas where they were forced to live behind barbed wire. My family, both sides of my family, boarded buses on this site. <clears throat> in total, over 100, <clears throat> excuse me, 28,000 individuals of Japanese heritage were removed from their homes and interned in these camps. And when you think about this, when, with this number, two thirds were American citizens. They were born here. Thousands were children and young adults. And every school day, they were required to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And we all know it ends with justice and liberty for all. These individuals were with their families behind barbed wires. They did, were not experiencing <clears throat> justice and liberty for all. Now there's individuals right now who are talking about the mass roundup of immigrants and placing them in de detention camps before deportation. We cannot let this happen. That's what this whole subject is about today, the fragility of democracy. Our voices and actions must address and stand up against this potential injustice. The last thing I want to say is I want to recognize and express my sincere thanks and the thanks of our community to Attorney General Bonta for his apology and acknowledgement of his office's role in the removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. As many of you know, one of his predecessors, Earl Warren, played a principal role in this atrocity. Following the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which resulted in redress and reparations for members of the Japanese community who suffered the injustices of evacuation, relocation, and internment during World War II. It wasn't the money, folks. It was the apology. Like many immigrant communities, like the Japanese community, <clears throat> they have an immense amount of pride. What happened to them was horrific, but the apology was important. And so on that note, what's important is that for Attorney General Banta, what he did to issue an apology is something that will stay with our community, will be honored by our community, and we offer him a profound thanks and respect. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. I now have the great privilege to introduce today's keynote introduction speaker, Don Tamaki. Don is a senior counsel at Minami Tamaki, having received his BA and JD from Berkeley. In the 1980s, he was a member of the remarkable pro bono legal team that reopened the landmark 1944 Supreme Court case of Fred Korematsu, overturning Korematsu's criminal conviction for refusing as an American citizen to be incarcerated on account for his racial ancestry. Don co-founded the Asian Law Alliance and has served as the executive director of the Asian Law Caucus. He also co-founded Stop Repeating History to educate the public on the dangers of unchecked presidential power, drawing parallels between the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II and the Trump administration's policy targeting minority groups based on race and religion. In 2021, Don was appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom to the California Reparations Task Force to study the cumulative, historic, and present-day impact of enslavement, Jim Crow oppression, and segregation, and to recommend to the legislature what California should do to address these harms. Without further ado, please welcome Don Tamaki. Yes, I'm freezing too. <laughs> Uh, it's a real honor to be here with Attorney General Rob Bonta, thank you, and uh, Senior Assistant Attorney General Damon Brown, uh, who've done so much to further civil rights in California uh, and really lead, do things that lead the nation here. Uh, thank you so much to Janum and Burroughs and to the organizers of this event, especially Elizabeth Sarine. I really appreciate that. Um, it's nice to see old friends and... Um, Apologies to, to those who've heard my rant like 10 times before. Uh, can't help myself, I'm still an angry Asian man. Um, 
So we're, it's fitting that we're here at the Democracy Center because the truth itself, and therefore democracy itself, is under threat as never before. In 2021, the Capitol was defiled, five people died, 25,000 troops were deployed to protect the peaceful transfer of power, and millions continue to believe the election was stolen despite no evidence of that. Uh, Within just hours of the deadly insurrection, 147 House members amplified this lie by voting to overturn the election. With, with much of Congress bending to the will of a demagogue, if it wasn't for the judicial branch and a few officials resisting enormous pressure, including death threats, the nation would be in a very different place today. When conspiracy theories take root and alternative facts hold sway over the real ones. History tells us that society can descend into a very dark place wherein the truth doesn't matter and therefore the constitu Constitution doesn't matter. Think Germany, 1933. This is how dictators get started. So how do we get here? Well, we've seen this movie before, the rounding up of 120,000 Japanese Americans also occurred when truth was abandoned. While this sad chapter should just be an anomaly, regrettably, sadly, it is more relevant now than ever. That's why Attorney General Bonta deserves high praise for his office's apology shining a light on truth and memorializing the fragility of our democracy, as when, it was pointed out, Earl Warren then the attorney general running for governor found more political currency in stoking the racism of a fearful public than in standing up for truth. Under Executive Order 9066, General John L. DeWitt ordered the mass removal, but Fred Korematsu, a loyal American citizen, refused. He was jailed, and within weeks was tried and convicted. He appealed. In defending against Fred's appeal, the Army claimed that Japanese Americans were spying, but because not a single Japanese American was ever even charged with espionage, the burden fell on DeWitt to issue a final report to justify putting Americans into concentration camps. There was only one problem. It was entirely made up, and the government knew it at the time. Korematsu had been convicted not of espionage, but for the crime of being Japanese-American. Two years later, 1944, his case landed before the U.S. Supreme Court. Solicitor General Charles Fahey exhorted the court not to second-guess the judgment of a military commander that incarcerating these Americans was necessary for the nation's safety. But instead of demanding truth, proof of wrongdoing. The court reasoned, if a general says that locking up Americans make the nation safer, we believe him. That landmark decision has been long remembered as a civil liberties disaster because it so utterly disregarded truth. Decades passed. My parents rarely talked about their bitter experience until one day in 1982, I showed them secret wartime intelligence reports that had been discovered by researchers Peter Irons and Aiko Yoshinaga Herzig. These reports had been misfiled in the Commerce Department and lost for almost 40 years. The documents revealed a scandal of epic proportions. As Justice Department lawyers prepared the government's defense against Korematsu's challenge, they called up these intelligence reports from the Navy, the FBI, the Federal Communications Commission, expecting to find evidence of spying that would corroborate DeWitt's uh, claims. To their surprise, they found the opposite. These re reports categorically admitted that Japanese Americans had done no wrong, that there was no reason for the mass removal, and that the Army's espionage claims were, quote, intentional falsehoods. Caught in an ethical dilemma, alarmed Justice Department lawyers became whistleblowers, urging the Solicitor General 
that they had a duty to disclose the evidence and not to lie to the Supreme Court. They were ignored. This evidence was suppressed, altered, and one crucial report was even ordered burned. Moreover, because these whistleblowers balked at peddling lies to the court, their superiors did an end run around them by arranging for DeWitt's report to be filed via the amicus briefs of the state attorney generals of California, of Washington, and of Oregon, essentially enlisting them in the deception. The Solicitor General stood behind the fabricated assertions in the DeWitt's report, knowing that every intelligence agency had thoroughly debunked its claims. 37 years later, our legal team argued that a fraud on the U.S. Supreme Court had been perpetrated by the government, and in 1983, in a San Francisco courtroom packed with camp survivors, a federal court found truth. The government had lied and threw out Fred's criminal conviction. This truth-telling process boosted our 20-year movement for reparations. Over the years, I've wondered how anti-Japanese American hatred could be so overpowering as to cause all three co-equal branches of government, each designed to be a check and balance on the excesses of the other, to fail so spectacularly. Before serving on the Reparations Task Force, delving into slavery and its aftermath, I viewed the incarceration as a standalone example of anti-Asian hate. Now I view it as a subchapter in a racial pathology that began long before Asian Americans arrived on this country's shores. While there is no equivalence between four years in a concentration camp and 400 years of oppression, the state's history is rife with instances of how what began as anti-black animus so easily morphed to target other people of color too. Four, more, four months after Mr. Floyd was murdered on May 25th, 2020, AB 3121 was passed, creating the Reparations Task Force to unpack the truth of harms perpetrated over a very long time, educate the public about it, and develop reparations proposals. As important as the apology we commemorate today is, of greater impact is Attorney General Bonta's allocation of huge resources over an intense two-year period to support the truth-telling work of the task force assigning Special Assistant Attorney General Damon Brown, Senior Assistant Attorney General Michael Newman, and Deputy Attorney General Zi Young Yang to supervise some 20 brilliant Department of Justice attorneys, at least three PhD analysts, a dozen staffers, four economists, and many university professors and scholars. So on June 29th of 2023, after two years of intense work, 27 days of hearings, 48 hours of testimony from expert and lay witnesses, we presented a groundbreaking, authoritative 1,100-page final report to the legislature, drawing a through line from 246 years of enslavement, another 90 years of Jim Crow exclusion and racial terror, and decades after decades more of continuing discrimination resulting in today's outcomes and for which we made over 115 recommendations for repair. Fellow task force member Lisa Holder calls this report the book of truth. From the nation's birth, the Constitution protected slavery. Half of the nation's pre-Civil War presidents were enslavers while in office. More than 1,800 members of Congress representing 37 states once enslaved black people. California entered the Union in 1850 as a non-slave state, but since it was not a crime to keep someone enslaved in California, enslavers entered California during the gold rush and they brought their human property with them. By 1852, legislators passed fugitive slave laws 
and barred, quote, black, mulatto, or Indian people from testifying against white people in court. By 1867, California Democrats rose to power by promising to oppose any laws making black, indigenous, or Chinese people equal to white people. At that time, there were few black people in the state, so hate groups mainly terrorized Chinese communities, and the law did not protect them since our Supreme Court decided that the ban on black people testifying against white people applied to Chinese people too. Between 1850 and 1935, there were 352 documented lynchings in California, including of eight black Californians, but mostly of persons of Chinese, indigenous, and Mexican descent. By 1882, Congress passed the nation's first travel ban, the Chinese Exclusion Act. During this ultra-racist era, Japanese immigrants arrived. A slew of anti-Asian legislation followed, including California's 1913 alien land laws prohibiting Japanese immigrants from owning most kinds of real property. By the 1920s, white supremacist groups flourished in the West, with sizable Ku Klux Klan populations or chapters in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in Oakland, Anaheim, Riverside, Fresno, and San Jose. So when Tanferan Racetrack, near San Francisco, was transformed into a temporary prison, surrounded by barbed wire and machine gun towers, and 8,000 people, including my mother and father, were herded into horse stalls reeking of manure. They didn't miss the irony that the racetrack's toilets and drinking fountains were segregated by signs reading white and colored, indicative of how deeply Jim Crow had infected California and how anti-black policies so easily shifted to make the incarceration of Japanese Americans so normal as to be beyond question. But while racial animus against Asian Americans ebbed and flowed, the targeting of black people remained constant. California became a leader in racial segregation. For example, by the 1940s, 80% of the homes in Los Angeles had deed restrictions barring black families. Black people were excluded from the benefits of the New Deal and from federal home loans, which created America's middle class. Black neighborhoods were zoned as industrial, regardless of their residential character, thereby allowing polluting industries to locate there. Freeways and other developments, which vastly increased the wealth and productivity of entire regions, were often run through uh, black neighborhoods destroying thousands of homes and businesses. As a result, white households today have nine times more assets than black households. Black people have shorter life expectancies. For example, in San Francisco, over the last decade, black infant mortality was five times that of white babies. And huge disparities persist in housing, in health care, education, employment, criminal justice, and just about every metric that matters. Today, over 600 organizations have endorsed reparations. Over 50 of them are Japanese American groups. Why? Why should Japanese American groups, why would Japanese American groups support black reparations? Let me answer that by juxtaposing two seemingly unrelated historical events. In 1943, 63-year-old James Wakasa was confined at Topaz concentration camp in Utah, along with Fred Korematsu, my mother and father, and about 10,000 other Americans. One evening, Wakasa decides to take a stroll along the camp's barbed wire fence line. From 300 yards away, a sentry atop a guard tower took aim and fired, the bullet striking Wakasa in the chest and killing him. No inquest was held and the guard was exonerated after claiming Wakasa was trying to escape. Two years later, 1945, O'Day Short, his wife Helen, seven-year-old Carol Ann, and nine-year-old Barry moved into the house they built in Fontana, California. Sheriffs warned Short 
they should go back to their own black neighborhoods. His real estate agent advised, vigilantes had a meeting here last night, and if I were you, I'd get my family out of here. Two weeks later, the house explodes. Neighbors see Helen try to beat back the flames consuming her children. All family members died. The San Bernardino County District Attorney decided it was an accident. The California Attorney General concluded that there was no evidence of vigilante in Fontana that could be found. Other than the fact that these events occurred just within two years of each other, what ties them together? I would say that the answer is that the hate resulting in the deaths of James Wakasa and the Odell Short family has its origins in the racism that propped up the institution of slavery and its aftermath. Slavery has existed in the world for thousands of years, but it was only in the past 400 to 500 years that white Europeans developed an extreme form based on skin color, which reduced human beings to property. A status that was permanent, it was inheritable, it was multi-generational. In the words of Martin Luther King, thingifying them, thereby making normal the most heinous crimes against humanity. Following the end of slavery, this cultural norm, valuing white lives above all others, morphed into forms of hate that put a target on the backs of not just African Americans, but other people of color, including James Wakasa. Simply put, if you can thingify black people, then stigmatizing any other disfavored group du jour is easy. Slavery begat the cultural foundation of America's racial hierarchy of white people on top, black and indigenous people on the bottom, and everybody else somewhere in between. And as long as the racial pathology that originated in 1619 remains unreckoned, the racial hierarchy that is spawned will numbingly recycle. We know this is true by just looking at recent history, when Asian Americans were blamed for the Chinese virus, when Mexicans were called drug dealers and rapists, when Muslims were labeled as terrorists, when white supremacists declared that Jews were poised to replace them, when LGBTQ people were demonized, and one, 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 more, one more African American person, among countless others, was killed during an encounter with law enforcement, and it barely evoked a shrug, because it is so normal. As we remember the image of Confederate flag-toting insurrectionists smashing their way into a capital, into the capital, longing for a racialized social order that should have ended with the Civil War. We realize much is at stake in 2024. No, our response to this recycling pathology cannot be a shrug. This time, we need to trace it back whence it originated, uncovered the buried truth, and repair the cascading harms that flowed from 1619 and era to era thereafter. That is the value of the Attorney General's apology and his support of the Reparations Task Force. Of course, no one enjoys truth that might make us feel bad. But if we don't face the ugly, inconvenient truth, how do we improve as a nation? More to the point, how do we save our democracy? Let it be remembered that the last president spent months in the run-up to the election, conditioning his followers to believe that the only way he could lose was if the election was rigged. When he did lose, his advisors urged him to declare martial law, fire the acting attorney general, and sub in a co-conspirator who would do his bidding. Fake electors were recruited in multiple states to cast phony electoral ballots. He pressured Georgia officials to find 11,800 votes. He summoned the mob. That, the, and that sent the vice president scurrying for his life because he dared to follow the Constitution. 
He now proclaims that, quote, immigrants are poisoning the, the blood of this country. That is the rhetoric of fascism. Folks, you can't make this stuff up. This is happening in America. So the truth telling of the Attorney General's apology and the reparations task force reminds us that democracy is not always lost in a sudden coup d'etat. No, we can lose our democracy incrementally. If alternative facts are trotted out in place of the real ones, if racism shouts louder than the Constitution, if our three-branch system of checks and balances, which was designed to thwart the rise of kings and tyrants, is undermined, and most importantly, if we fail to stand up and demand truth and accountability to the rule of law, our, Democrat, our, our democratic institutions can end up hollowed out from within to a point that we will no longer recognize them. I want to close by commending Janum, the organizers of this, of this event, especially Elizabeth Sarine, and most of all, uh, Attorney General Bonta and his leadership team, Assistant Senior Attorney General uh, Damon Brown among them, for teaching the nation that each time the country has shined a light on its wrongs, owned up to uncomfortable truths, repaired them and become more inclusive and more faithful to its ideals. It has become stronger, better, and a more perfect union. I thank you. Thank you, John, for that wonderful keynote introduction and for setting the context for today's discussion. We now have the pleasure of being joined by Janum CEO Ann Burroughs and our very own California State Attorney General Rob Bonta for a fireside chat as they explore what led Attorney General Bonta's historic apology and statement that acknowledged the complicity of the California Attorney General's office in the incarceration and dispossession of Japanese Americans during and after World War II. Please welcome Ann Burroughs and Attorney General Rob Bonta. we're on now we're on I'm sorry it's so cold in here <laughs> um, Don thank you for that extraordinarily erudite um, speech that you gave and just your extraordinary framing of just how the thread of racial pathology through the history of this country and for reminding us of just how incredibly fragile our democracy is in this country. Attorney General Bonta, welcome to Janum. It's a real honor. It's a real honor. And it's a, it's a real privilege. It's a real privilege to have you here. You heard Bill speak a little bit earlier about the sanctity of the space and that for us at Janum, this is hallowed ground because in many, in many respects, it's one of those um, uh, ground zero points in the civil rights history of this country. So it's just enormously important to have you here today talking about this extraordinary apology that you issued last year. You know, Don has already given us an idea. Everybody knows what it is. Bill has talked about the importance of it, but it's profound in so many ways, and it will have ramifications and repercussions for many, many, many years to come. So it's, it's just, it's wonderful to have you here. It's wonderful to have you here. So what we're going to do in our conversation today is just to talk about that apology. Um, we, can, we can come at it from, from many different perspectives, but I thought that I would start by asking you what was it that motivated you to issue that apology and why did you feel that it was important to frame it as a reparative apology? Thank you, Anne. 
helps to turn it on. So, all right, we're on. Uh, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Rob Bonta, Attorney General. Honored, grateful to be here. The honor is truly mine to be here in this hallowed space to talk about our future and where we go from here. Um, let me first just thank Janum and Bill uh, for having me, for hosting us. Thank you to my team uh, for everything you've done to get us here, for the work that you've done. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of us, uh, what we've accomplished and what we're continuing to, to push forward on. And uh, Don, thank you for your, your insight, your inspiration. Um, you've had a lot of folks, um, whether you knew it or not, who you inspired, including me. So thank you. Um, excited to be here. And um, the apology. One of the things that we really wanted to do in our office um, when I became the AG, and everyone who holds a role brings themselves to it, their, their lived experience, their values, their priorities, their passions. And one of the things that I believed we could do better as a DOJ was to not be perceived as the place where there's bureaucratic buildings and people in suits behind security and get out into the community and uh, hear from community and be in circles and be at tables and um, hear about painful things and challenges and struggles and co-create solutions together. And that means talking to community. And we wanted to inst not just say that, but we wanted to institutionalize it. And we have. We have a, a part of our team is called the Community Awareness Response and Engagement Team that does outreach and, and, and conversation. And uh, we were engaged in a conversation with uh, Japanese American leaders and civil rights and civil liberties leaders who uh, encouraged us to be part of a healing process, something that we were very um, excited about being a part of and playing a role in. And you know, to the very poignant points made by Don, you can't change the past, but you can acknowledge it, you must acknowledge it, you can apologize for it, and you can make sure it, it never happens again and take affirmative steps to do the opposite of the painful thing, the unjust thing, the racist thing. And it's important for communities to be seen, heard, and valued. And um, to Bill's point about the apology being far more important than the reparations mm -hmm. uh, with the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, uh, we wanted to do, play a role as well, acknowledge the thing that my uh, institutional um, office done it did historically, to say it was wrong, to say, um, it was a mistake, it was unjust. Um, it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't an accident. It was a deliberate offense, um, uh, an atrocity that was unimaginable and unacceptable and created incalculable pain. And uh, to acknowledge the specific role we had, not to make it general, but to own what specific attorneys general in the Department of Justice did. Um, taking away land from those of, of Japanese ancestry wrongfully, unjustly, destroying livelihoods, um, testifying in Congress as part of Executive Order 9066 in support of it, um, being a, a, a loud advocate for it in, in our office, um, and, and later writing an amicus brief um, in support of the unjust, wrongful, racist um, imprisonment of Fred Korematsu. So we need to acknowledge that, and we did. And we apologize, and, and it was important that we apologize for it, and that the community um, and all those um, who, who are, are part of the, the legacy of that community, the following generations who've been hurt and harmed, know that um, it's acknowledged, we, we apologize, and, and we are gonna do better. And so um, we also wanted to do it on the 35th anniversary of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, and we did. And in that spirit of, of um, healing and truth and reconciliation and transformation, we wanted to do our part. And particularly important given the environment that we're in, and an environment that is too often anti-truth, uh, too often um, about division, and extremism and hate and differences instead of unity and uh, love and inclusion and support and um, uplifting diversity and our, our um, and the things that make us different also the things that make us great. So we wanted to be an antidote and a response to some of the um, very challenging and painful 
threats that we're seeing in, in and to our democracy and to be a, a source of light and, and healing in, in response. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, the my next question was going to be um, the historic nature of 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 the apology. You know, did that factor into your decision? Because there's been, you know, going back obviously to Attorney, Attorney General Earl Warren. Have you ever sort of thought about what he, what kind of insights can you offer? What it might have been like for him? I mean, you can't possibly put yourself in his shoes. But he held, you know, it was a different time, it was a different context, but he held the same position that you do. As to the historic component, I, you know, I think that's for others to, to view and decide. It's not something that we thought of. We don't chase history or, or try to do things that are historic. We try to do things that are right. And they will be whatever they will be in, in the eye of the beholder. Some people will hate it. Some people think it's wrong. Some people will criticize it. Others will think it's um, important and valuable and healing. And uh, we can't think about that too much. We think about what's right and what, the, what, what we should be doing. And we thought this was the right thing to do uh, at the time that we did it. And um, we stand by uh, that. And, and others can judge it and, um, you know, if, if and when they please. Earl Warren, you know, he, I, this, he's known for many things, and this is not one that he's um, universally known for, but it's part of who he is, part of his legacy. Um, fully realize that um, war time or times of, of conflict create uh, a different environment, and it can be emotional and it can be um, uh, powerful, and it requires even greater commitment to our underlying values, our democratic values, the principles that we live by and define us, civil liberties, civil rights, freedoms, um, due process, fairness, justice, a recommitment to that, not a departure from that, and to, to choose to cater to um, Fear, things, fears, and 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 wrong ideas for for personal benefit. I, I think that's that is something that Mr. Warren will have to uh, own, and it will be part of his legacy. And and we all have long lives and careers. We do many things in our lives, and some things are worthy of of um, accolades and 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 positive reinforcement. And some things need to be criticized. Um, and recognized for what they are. So this is this. I don't really think about um, so much, um, you know, him and his role. I, I think about my role, my time, what I can do in the window of opportunity that I have to make people's lives better. And um, I always operate like I'm running out of time. I want to do more. I want to do it yesterday. I want to deliver as much as possible to those in need, um, and that's my goal. Um, I think comparisons and um, you know, historical perspectives can be, can be left for others at another time. Uh, the most important time for me is now, and what we have done, uh, what we do next, and who we help and how much we help them. Well, you know, certainly for us here, um, history is important, but we, it's important because we need to learn those lessons, and we need to be able to use those lessons of history to influence an imperfect present and, you know, to shape a more just future. You know, earlier today, before the program started, you stamped a series of names in the Erecho. And for those of you who don't know, it's a book that we have here that for the first time gathers together the names of over 125,000 people of Japanese ancestry that were incarcerated in over 75 confinement sites um, during, the, during the Second World War. And for us at Jainam, it's not just a book. Um, we know how important names are. Um, but for us, it's a monument. It's very different from a monument, for example, of, of you know, names where names may be engraved in stone or there may be, you know, somebody uh, cast in bronze on a, on a marble plinth, which derives its power from its permanence. You know, this monument, the Arecho, derives its power 
from each stamping. It accrues its power from each stamping. So for us here at Janum, and certainly for people that have had um, had the experience of stamping names of people who've been incarcerated, their own names or family members' names, they talk about it as being an act of, of repair um, and an act of memory. But it's more than just memory because it's also memory as justice, um, as an act of justice. And I would love to hear from you what what went through your mind as you were doing that? There is such a there is such a symmetry between your apology um, and this extraordinary this extraordinary um, act of of repair. And I know that you were doing that on behalf of people who are in your office. So tell us about that, please. Thank you. Uh, let me just f first mention my, my agreement with your your point about the the lens of, of history to make sure we're not repeating mistakes and to see trends and to um, guard against them and to make sure we, we commit to um, the, the best of who we are in the most vulnerable times. I completely agree with that. As a student of history, that's what I studied in, in, in college and continue to look back in history for lessons. Um, the stamping ceremony was was powerful and, and I can see how even more powerful it uh, would be for a family member, including family members um, in my own office uh, who are here who are here today, and and are here with us now, um, Tyler and his mother, and it's exactly what you said, it, you know, and 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 to to see the book, I mean, first it's 125,000 names, every one uh, meaningful, important, uh, so, someone. Uh, who, whose life mattered, who meant the world to those in their circle of love and family, who was abused and, and mistreated and had something um, irreparable taken away from them, and from 90-year-olds to those who were born um, in, in, in the camps and everything in between. And for, you know, this wasn't something that just happened eight, eight decades ago. And and it it has created intergenerational trauma. It's carried today by by loved ones and the next generation and family members. And to see their name, to to mark it uh, with recognition and acknowledgement and love, and to um, um, acknowledge uh, the pain, the wrong, uh, but also to say, you know, I, I see you, I value you, I, I love you, and I'm remembering you. And it's a powerful thing. And it's, it's happened tens of thousands of times. I got to be a, a part of a, a number of them, including in my own office. And not lost on me that the office uh, that was involved in the actions for which I apologized for has now family members who were on the receiving very painful, unjust end of those actions. And we're now acknowledging those families in, 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 in the book with the stamping ceremony. So it was powerful. And um, I, I, I thank um, Jana for making that a process that is available and open to m the next generation. Uh, there's a, a phrase we all know about, hurt, hurt people, hurt people. It's also heal the people, yeah. heal people, yeah. and can be part of a legacy of healing and uh, transformation and restoration. You know, certainly at, at, you know, for us here, it's become, Janam has become a point of pilgrimage because of the book. People have come from all over the country. People have come from all over the world to be able to, to stamp that book. And in many ways, it's given us a different form of presence. So it's, it's so fitting that you should do that. And thank you for doing that. Um, it means, it certainly means, it certainly means so much to us. Um, you know, Don's speech drew some very stark parallels between the wrongful incarceration of Japanese Americans and the history of racial pathology that began long, long before and was used to justify the institution of slavery. Can you share some of your thoughts about, about some of those points that Don raised earlier and particularly the fragility of our democratic institutions um, and how deeply democracy is imperiled in this country? You know, the one of the things that I think was so powerful and important about Don's speech was the radical truth-telling that it involves. And 
it's not always easy to hear. It's not something that people want to hear about who we are and where we've been, but it's it, we must hear it. And uh, truth telling is 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 the antidote and the remedy to much of what ails us in this country. And to recognize the history, the themes, the interconnections, you know, the parallels he drew in his his talk between uh, the racism, institutional racism, and pathology that affected. Um, the you know indigenous community and and the black community and um, the Japanese American community and to see the through line um, with respect to many different groups that have been othered and treated as less than and see it as you know dehumanized um, uh, when you see it through that lens as, as was so articulately shared it, it's it, you know you you can't help but 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 see that that painful truth and. Um, and it's not something to, to just dwell on the pain, but you, you, but you can't fix the problem until you face it. And and it's what we do next that matters. And to make sure that we um, heal, acknowledge, um, and and do better. And you know our history, unfortunately, from uh, the founding in this country has been rife with racism, institutional, from slavery to Jim Crow to um, Native American genocide, the Muslim ban, the um, alien land laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not something that's just in the past. It's, it's, it's now. You know, multiple states have alien land laws. Now, we, we you know, we, the, the attacks on the LGBTQ plus community, on the immigrant community, the, the ripping away and tearing away of rights and freedoms and liberties, um, and, and seen through that context of the past and history, um, I think is a call to action for us to do more and to uh, not let people hide the truth through uh, book bans or censorship. Um, the truth and the, in our history is our path forward to, to, to do better and, 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 and do different. And so, um, you know, it, 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 it rung true to me uh, as, as Don's teachings have for, for years and is uh, uh, an important call to action about where we go from here. Our, our democracy is threatened, there's no doubt. Uh, it, it, it has been, it continues to be, um, and it's been battle tested and stress tested. It's survived so far and I believe will continue to survive. But. Our democracy is based on the power of, of, of us, on we, of the people. The people have always had and will always have the first and the last word. The power in government and in our democratic institutions emanates from the people. We give it to others and we can take it away from those who are irresponsible or shirk their responsibilities or misuse it or abuse it. And so democracy is a, is, is a contact sport. It requires action and activism and engagement and participation. Um, speaking up and speaking out, organizing and activating. Um, the, 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 the opposite or the biggest threat to democracy isn't um, a certain party, although I think one party is more, threatened, uh, more of a threat to democracy than another, uh, my own personal opinion, or one person, although there is one person that I think is a major threat to democracy right now. The biggest threat is apathy, not engaging, not caring, not being involved. Um, fascists and demagogues cannot win in our system. The people have the power, but we have to exercise it, own it, use our agency, um, and not be shy about it. So. Um, it's what we do from here that, that matters. And as, as someone who uh, was proudly raised by parents who are activists, from a dad who was involved in the civil rights movement and marched in Selma, to both parents who worked for the United Farm Workers of America, to a mom who brought me to rallies and demonstrations and protests fighting for the restoration of democracy back in the Philippines, I saw people power time and time again prevail. And the, my parents show me that we have agency. We're not destined to be bystanders or spectators as the future unfolds before us and just have to accept the unacceptable and whatever it is, but we can shape it and bend it and move it to where it needs to be, to more fair places, to more just places. And, and we're best when we do that in beautiful coalitions. Um, coalitions like the farm worker movement, which started with Filipino Americans and Latinos and later joined by black Americans and white Americans and became an undeniable force for good and justice. Um, we can continue to build those movements of, of, of good 
that lift up democracy. And we have had threats in this democracy before. Uh, we've seen world wars and civil wars. We've seen um, depressions and recessions. We've seen international pandemics. And yet we remain a, a powerful democracy, a beacon of light and hope to the rest of the world. Um, but we, would need to, we need to continue to cultivate and nurture and fight for our democracy. And if the people do that, then, um, then uh, you know, it, 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 it's inevitable. Uh, democracy will continue, but it, it is what we do next as the people that will determine where democracy goes from here. Well, it's it's really rousing to hear that in the space, our democracy center, where we bring people together to talk about difficult issues and to engage them in in the process and engage them in in looking at the fragility of democracy and how we heal that, how we move that forward and how we do it together. Um, I know that we're almost out of time and I know that you have a very tight schedule. I have many, many more questions, but I have one more question in particular that I wanted to ask you and that's really about the um, the, 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 model, the modern revival in states like Florida and Texas of the alien land laws. You know, the, the, the specifics of the law differ. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, obviously. Um, but the rhetoric behind each of the laws remains exactly the same, um, where people are fair game um, if they, they if, if, if it's fair and prudent to view them with suspicion and to equate them with the actions of their countries of origin when those countries pose a real and imminent danger to the United States. Um, in, in a couple of sentences, because we don't have a lot of time left, can you, can you help those non-lawyers amongst us um, understand why that rhetoric is so incredibly dangerous? And how California, because of our history here, um, and because of the actions of you and your team and your staff, how can we help remind the rest of the country that we've already been down this road before? I mean, to your point earlier, this is the, the value and power and potency of history. We've been there. We've seen it. Uh, we've seen that movie before. We've seen the pain and that atrocity already. And it's, it, is, it is history repeating itself. And um, almost exactly, um, you know, sort of superficial arguments around national security, but really fueled fundamentally by, by racism and otherness and scapegoating um, and injustice have led to these actions. And um, you can see the, that when it, 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 how it matters what elected officials say and how they say it. When the person with the most powerful platform and megaphone uh, in the world says things like, um, Kung flu and, and the, the, the China virus and gives permission and license to um, uh, be racist and blame others and hurt others, that has consequences. And, and, and as it does when leaders um, support bills like AB2, SB 264 in Florida, uh, which needed to be challenged, it was challenged, it's been uh, put on hold because it's unlawful, violates the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and that needs to continue. We need people to stand up and um, s speak out as leaders against those types of actions. And, and look, we, California is special. Uh, we believe um, a first and best uh, in, in so many things in this nation. And we have a legislator who had a similar uh, alien land law um, that, was, um, that she introduced twice here in California in the legislature. Uh, didn't pass, but um, you, you can see the intent and 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 the existence of that of that sentiment here. So, um, you know, we, we we've seen this before. The answer is to uh, you know use the checks and balances in our system, including the courts, but also for leaders to speak out against this um, you know race these racist harmful actions, as many have done. Thank you, and I know we're almost out of time. We've probably got one minute left. So I'm going to ask you if there's anything that you'd like to say in, in closing before we close out this segment of, of the program. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here with all of you. It's special for me to be here. This um, uh, very place was where I had my Southern California inauguration as I, I, I launched my, um, my elected um, term tenure. And I, I always 
I pinch myself that I'm in this role as California Attorney General. I sometimes secretly check on the website to see if my name is still there and my photo is still there and it's very affirming when I see it. Um, and, uh, you know, positions like this are um, time limited and uh, for me, my goal is to do as much good, create as much justice, take on, right as many wrongs as possible in the time that I have. And, uh, we can only do that in partnership with allies in, in this work. So um, sometimes you don't get recognized for the important work that you do. I want to recognize it. I want to thank you. I see you as partners and collaborators for good. Uh, we have more good we need to create. Um, more, uh, we have challenges ahead, uh, but there's nothing that we can't overcome if we take care of one another, have each other's backs, and fight together. So uh, please know the California Department of Justice will always fight with you. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General Bonta. Well, thank you, Anne, and Attorney General Bonta, for that dynamic discussion and for both of your courageous leadership in protecting civil rights for all and inspiring us for that radical truth telling and um, for us to continue the fight for democracy. So at this time, we will now take a short intermission, intermission break. Um, please join us back here at 2.15 p.m. for an enlightening panel discussion covering alien land laws and other attacks on our civil liberties. Thank you. I'd like to introduce the next set of our speakers. Moderating today's panel is Susan Kamei. Susan is author of When Can We Go Back to America? Voices of Japanese American Incarceration During World War II, and recognized as a leading scholar and educator on our country's unjustified wartime imprisonment of persons of Japanese ancestry. A descendant of incarcerates, she was a volunteer attorney in the legislative campaign that resulted in the successful passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. She draws upon personal family and community stories to convey the continuing consti constitutional relevance of this tragic episode in our history to contemporary issues of racial identity, immigration, and citizenship. She is a graduate of the University of California, Irvine and Georgetown Law. Damon Brown is a Special Assistant Attorney General at California Department of Justice, serving as a Senior Legal Advisor on Civil Rights and Racial Justice Matters to California Attorney General Rob Bonta. Immediately preceding his appointment to Attorney General Bonta's executive leadership team in October 2021, Damon was the elected city attorney for the city of Compton. Damon is a graduate of the Vanderbilt University Law School and the University of California, Berkeley, where he earned degrees in African American Studies and Political Science. Jack Chin is the Edward L. Barrett Jr. Chair and Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law at UC Davis School of Law. Regularly appearing on his list of the most cited legal scholars, he writes about criminal procedure, immigration, and Asian Pacific American legal history. His legal work with students includes persuading the states of Kansas, New Mexico, and Wyoming to repeal anti-Asian alien land laws, which were still on the books, the Ohio legislature to ratify the 14th Amendment in 2003, and the California Supreme Court to posthumously admit an Asian American attorney to the bar after he was excluded because of his race. Jack is a graduate of Wesleyan and Michigan and Yale Law Schools. Lisa Doi is the project manager of the new core exhibit here at Jan Janum, Japanese American National Museum. In addition, she is a PhD candidate in American Studies at Indiana University. Her dissertation project is an ethnographic engagement with Japanese American pilgrimages to World War II incarceration sites. Lisa is the president of the Japanese American Citizens League in Chicago and a co-chair of Tsudu for Solidarity, where she has worked on campaigns focused on abolition and reparations. Clay Zhu is a first-generation immigrant and an American attorney. He is the managing partner of the Silicon Valley branch of Dehun Law Offices with a focus on commercial litigation and cross-border transactions. 
Clay spends significant time on pro bono cases for Asian Americans, including serving as co-lead counsel for of a successful lawsuit that challenged and overturned President Trump's executive order banning the use of WeChat, a popular social media app among Chinese Americans. In 2021, Clay co-founded a nonprofit called the Chinese American Legal Defense Alliance with a mission of using litigation to fight against discrimination against Chinese Americans, including public interest lawsuits against the federal government for the infamous China Initiative. Clay is also the organizer and co-lead counsel with ACLU on a current lawsuit against the Florida state government for its alien land law that was passed last year. Among many of his recognitions, Clay received the award of California Lawyer of the Year in Civil Rights from the Daily Journal in 2022. Please welcome our speakers for today's panel. Well, thank you, Amy. And on behalf of the panel, uh, for those kind introductions and for uh, this opportunity to thank all the presenting organizations uh, Janum for uh, being the host here. My mother and grandparents were among those that boarded the buses uh, outside. And so it, for every time I come, it's, it's a, it is a sacred um, opportunity. Uh, thank you, Don, for kicking us off with your remarks and certainly to Attorney General Bonta and Anne for setting the context for what we have collectively identified as an opportunity to get tactical, uh, to be able to kind of bring home uh, into action what uh, we need to be doing uh, in, in now in this current time of crisis and, and going forward. And so uh, we're pleased that Jack will be kicking us off with some historic context. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here and be part of this distinguished panel uh, talking about these important issues. I had the, uh, the honor of participating in an amicus brief in support of Clay's litigation against the new uh, Florida alien land law, which has now been enjoined uh, by the 11th Circuit. And uh, what we talked about in the amicus brief was to a significant extent the history of the old alien land law. Uh, the history begins, I would say, with uh, one of the first acts of the first Congress, the Naturalization Act of 1790, which limited naturalization to free white persons. Uh, uh, the manuscript uh, bill was signed by George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams in their roles, uh, uh, making bills become law. This was obviously a political document, who gets to be a citizen and vote, but it was also an immigration document because at the time, uh, uh, many states had laws that allowed only citizens to own land, have to be a US citizen to own land, uh, and agriculture was a much larger portion of the economy than it is even now. And so Congress understood at the time and the states understood at the time that they wanted people to immigrate to the United States. And if they wanted people to immigrate to the United States and populate uh, the country, they would have to have an easy form of naturalization because it cost a lot of money to get here and because that would give you the economic opportunity that would give you the incentive to immigrate but only, only the people they wanted, they only wanted the good immigrants and they defined that by race. Uh, at the time, uh, 1790, uh, the free white persons were, the, the category that they were trying to exclude was uh, uh, persons of African descent and indigenous people. They were, they were thinking of whites as opposed to the people who presented the race problem that existed at the time, blacks and, uh, and indigenous people. But immediately, it was clear that this restriction applied to uh, Asian people as well. United States versus Dow is a case that was written by Chief Justice Taney when he was on circuit. The Supreme Court justices used to 
try cases. He was trying a case in 1840 in Maryland, 17 years before he wrote his infamous Dred Scott decision where he said that persons of African ancestry had no rights which white people were bound to respect. But he, he clearly fit, at that early date, Asians into the, the racial, political, national structure that he imagined at the time. Dao was a, a Christian uh, from the Philippines, born in Manila. He was, uh, he was a Malay uh, in the racial uh, term of the time, a Filipino. Uh, and there were different rules of evidence for white people and non-white people. And Dow said, hey, I'm a Christian Filipino. I would prefer the white rules of evidence because they're better. And, <laughs> and Chief Justice Taney said, no, you're not white. You're not European. Uh, you might be Christian, but you're not European. And when we started this country, the only people that we wanted to come here and expected to come here were uh, uh, white Christians from Europe. Uh, that wasn't just crazy old Chief Justice Taney. The US Supreme Court in a unanimous decision in 1922 saying that a Japanese person wasn't white and could not naturalize said, that the racial restriction was a rule enforced from the beginning of the government, a part of our history as well as our law, welded into the structure of our national polity by a century of legislative and administrative acts and judicial decisions. And I think they're right. This is a fundamental founding principle of the United States that was rigorously enforced uh, uh, until 1952. It came into play in, in California, uh, both of these things in the California Constitution of 1879. Uh, foreigners of the white race or of African descent can own property like native-born citizens, not others. That was part of a larger uh, goal uh, of the California Constitution of 1879, which had a whole chapter, uh, Article 19, about Chinese and the ways to get rid of them. But it wasn't really about Chinese. It was about foreigners ineligible, become, ineligible to become citizens of the United States, uh, which included uh, uh, other Asians in addition to Chinese. Um, uh, and you know, going uh, back to what uh, Don Tamaki said uh, earlier about the importance of the connection between slavery and discrimination against Asians, by 1879, the naturalization law had been amended by Congress to allow the naturalization of persons of African nativity or descent. So, so here, uh, discrimination against Asians uh, stands on its own, even when it's not being inflicted on members of other groups. We have the, the implementation of these ideas in the California Alien Land Law of 1913. Aliens eligible to citizenship can own land. All other aliens uh, can own land only to the extent that they're allowed to do so by a treaty. This is still uh, an immigration law. Um, the California Supreme Court said in 1922, what's the purpose? Why? Why do we have a law that says that only aliens eligible to citizenship can own land? Well, because we don't want Japanese people to come to California. Uh, and, uh, and this is a legitimate purpose. It's an appropriate thing for the legislature to do. They can do it. Uh, the other alien land laws in other states, this is, this is uh, about the Florida alien land law. Uh, the newspaper reported that when it was adopted in 1926 by vote of the people of Florida at an initiative, that it had the sole intention of forestalling any further importation into Florida of Japanese, Chinese, and others of the Mongolian race. Uh, this was not just a California thing. This was a national uh, uh, policy, a national goal. Uh, all of these states in red had alien land laws that applied to Asians in particular uh, through one machination or another at one time or another. I don't know if you can see, but to the far right, Delaware jumped in uh, on the bandwagon at a certain point. Um, 
that this this was not isolated. Uh, the effort to ex to eliminate uh, Asians from owning land was one of the many things that was designed to discriminate against Asians. And of course, we're talking about Asians at the moment, but we could talk about discrimination in land ownership, uh, about indigenous people, African Americans, Mexican Americans too. So this is a small chapter of a system, uh, but one of the things that that sometimes surprises people uh, in terms of discrimination is the effort to prohibit white women from eating in or working in Chinese and Japanese restaurants. That was a thing. Uh, uh, the Los Angeles Times reported in 1915 uh, that only citizens were going to be allowed to work in restaurants and saloons. The change is designed to do away with the employment of Orientals in saloons and restaurants and give their places to citizens. Uh, so this is, this is the background. Uh, the happy part of the story is that a long time ago, this, uh, this was uh, done away with. And, and I don't know why we have to bring it back again, but between 1948 and 1953, perhaps in large part because of embarrassment about the Japanese American incarceration and the sort of shock of the, of the uh, 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 deviltry of that, uh, uh, the California Supreme Court declares the alien land laws unconstitutional. Congress passes a law that says anyone can become a citizen regardless of race. Another important thing, uh, that, that uh, people uh, sometimes are surprised to hear is that in 1951 and 1953, the California legislature passed laws giving all the money back. All the alien land law actions that had taken people's land from them, uh, they gave it all back. Sorry, it was a, it was a, it was a mistake. Uh, but nevertheless, here we are uh, in, in 2024. Coming, uh, coming back to it, and I, and I hope that the, that the courts will, will say that this uh, was a mistake that should not be repeated. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. That's a powerful background for us to consider. And when Attorney General uh, Bonta referred to this as a battle, uh, we have uh, some real uh, activity on the battlefront. Uh, and uh, Clay, would you uh, take a moment to uh, fill us in? Thank you, Jack. Um, I became a citizen um, in 2020 um, as a first generation immigrant from China uh, after leaving this country for more than 20 years. Um, I finally decided to get me get my uh, U.S. citizenship and give up my Chinese passport. I never talked publicly about why I did that. Well, the reason uh, is that I was scared. The year of 2020 uh, was a hard time for Chinese Americans in this country. Um, when the pandemic broke out, uh, when Donald Trump was in his re-election campaign, uh, for the first time in 20 plus years living in this country, I uh, did not feel safe. So I went ahead and get my citizenship. I thought that was my actual protection. I could show uh, my U.S. passport, say I belong here. Uh, I quickly realized um, it did not help because I could not you know, hide my face and change my skin color. Um, people will still tell me things when they see me. So I realized I had, had to do more, and I become a legal activist. Um, I have been a lawyer in this country for 20-some years. Uh, I mostly represent companies in commercial and corporate cases. So the only thing I guess I'm good at is going to court and suing people. <laughs> and that's what I did. In the summer of uh, 
2020, um, several colleagues and I uh, set up a nonprofit called the Chinese American Legal Defense Alliance. Uh, it's like the ACLU for Chinese Americans. Uh, we basically, you know, sue governments and officials for uh, systematic discrimination against Chinese Americans. Um, and since then, I have been uh, spending a substantial amount of my time doing pro bono work. Um, in the summer of uh, 2020, we first sued uh, President Trump for the WeChat ban. Um, that was a popular uh, messaging app for all the Chinese Americans. Uh, the ban came out during the height of the pandemic. Um, I could not go back to China anymore. Uh, my 88-year-old mom, WeChat was the only way for me to get in touch with her. So banning WeChat means I would not see my mom. Uh, it's personal. So I decided to organize a lawsuit and, uh, along with other uh, organizations. And um, we uh, successfully obtained the injunction against the president. Uh, the case was uh, widely publicized for the protection of uh, uh, freedom of speech and also racial justice. And also, we have been filed uh, four uh, separate pending uh, cases uh, against federal agencies for uh, the so-called China Initiative. Uh, it's a racial profiling and targeting program against Chinese American professors and uh, scientists in this country. And last May, uh, Governor uh, DeSantis and uh, this state legislature in Florida uh, get together and passed a bunch of law, and one of them was the Florida's uh, alien land law uh, in the name of, of course, national security. Um, the law came out uh, as a great surprise to me um, because I thought that was something happening, you know, 100 years ago. So upon hearing the news, um, we, our organization, uh, took quick action and we started mobilizing. Um, the law basically, just like, like Jack introduced, um, it was very similar to the California alien land law, uh, essentially banning Chinese Americans and people from other uh, six countries from buying and owning real estates in Florida. Uh, the law also um, requires, uh, if you are, you are already a real estate owner, you have to register with the state government. Um, it is basically turning the clock back um, we uh, persuaded ACLU to uh, come on board, and we jointly filed a lawsuit only a couple of weeks after the law was adopted. Um, I initially thought that was only a, a Florida case, but um, things quickly got out of hand. Um, I believe 12 or 13 red states immediately filed a amicus brief supporting Florida. And then U.S. DOJ stepped in. They filed a brief supporting us. And then about dozens of um, civil rights organizations and scholars, including Jack, uh, filing a uh, amicus brief supporting us. To prepare for the case, I had to read the Korematsu case again, um, especially the dissenting opinions. Um, I thought that case belongs to the history book you know, to tell people how far this country has come. But, but I, I was wrong, you know. Florida is going back in time. Um, we had a, unfortunately, a, a Trump-appointed judge in the federal district court. Um, the judge uh, refused to issue an injunction uh, during our um, a motion. Uh, we quickly appealed to the 11th Circuit. Uh, we just got good news early this month. The Court of Appeals has uh, granted a partial injunction, uh, but that first uh, win was just only the first step. Uh, we're going back to Florida again in April for a full hearing uh, at the Court of Appeals. Um, I will be there and also along with my ACLU colleagues. Florida is not the only state. Um, Texas just put a similar any land law bill on its primary election ballot about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, about several, about a dozen red states already adopting some forms of alien land law as we speak. So 
It's, it's a game of whack-a-mole, and uh, we've been busy. Um, I can report to you that I do not feel any safer than four years ago because of the grave dangers we're facing today. But uh, I'm happy to say that I'm already feeling the impact and the difference that my team and I have been working as a legal uh, defense and legal aid organization. So enough talk. Let's go to work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clay. My father is an Orange County farming family before and after the war. And at one point, he told me that he and his siblings had a very itinerant childhood. They moved every two, three years. They had very interrupted education. Um, but it was years before I put the dots together to realize that it was because they couldn't, because the alien land law, they couldn't hold a lease for longer than three years. So, so uh, Damon, uh, you are also on the on the front line and have a array of uh, ex experiences and initiatives underway uh, for the broader application of, of what we're what we're fighting for and what we're fighting against. I do. Thank you, um, and it's great to be here today. Um, it's what's really interesting is the way that we see hate and racism permeate uh, so much of life um, and the way that it is set up uh, to do so. Um, the Department of Justice, uh, when we are dealing with uh, public rights, affirmative rights, uh, addressing issues uh, on behalf of Californians, we're looking at systems. We uh, rarely get involved in individual matters. We leave that often to local law enforcement to, to, to deal with. But we address systems that can have oppressive effects on everyday Californians. And so in dismantling what's wrong with the system, the idea is that the individuals will benefit and that the civil liberties of individuals will be protected. And I think that it does merit reflecting upon even the foundations of this country. And I know that this is an uncomfortable, you know, topic for many in our society. But when you look at how this country was founded, the ideals of this country were laudable and ones that we all hold ourselves to account today. However, the systems that were implemented to carry out those objectives were implemented to uphold white supremacy. That was the objective. And white supremacy, anything that challenged white supremacy was struck down. And that was used through the law, that was used through the courts, that was used through the legislature, and we see that here as we're talking about these various land laws today. Um, land was another uh, effort, and I don't think it should be lost on anyone that these laws are taking and depriving individuals of land ownership. Land ownership is directly connected to power and agency in this country. You could not vote in this country unless you were a white male landowner, which also disenfranchised poor whites. You could not vote in many places if you were not a landowner. Uh, land ownership entitled you to many benefits of political participation. And so by taking land, uh, that was a way to disenfranchise people. And even the restoration of land, as, as was mentioned earlier, in giving back um, you know, money, uh, when we talk about reparations, the original reparations were intended to be 40 acres and a mule to freed uh, 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 African, uh, Africans who had been enslaved here. Uh, and in many instances, those 40 acres and a mule were given to the white landowners to compensate them for the loss of their slave labor. Um, and yet, once again, disenfranchising ownership, land ownership, which is critical to not only wealth creation, but political participation. So um, I, I think it's important to continue to have this uh, discussion, understanding why land is at issue here, why that is what is looking 
uh, being looked at as a way to disenfranchise, in this case, Japanese and other Asian uh, people here in this country, uh, because it's a threat to white supremacy. Uh, and those that would uphold those uh, systems and institutions in this country to maintain power will go to any lengths in order to keep it. And this is another way to do that. And so uh, at the Department of Justice, um, Attorney General Bonta, upon being uh, appointed initially to office, created the Racial Justice Bureau uh, within the Civil Rights Enforcement Section. And I'm you know, excited to have some of my colleagues here from uh, what we call CRESS. Um, who are a part of this effort, and that is to look at these systems and to see how it is that racial injustice is being perpetuated through systems and what we can do uh, in order to dismantle them. Um, and we see it popping up everywhere. And, I, and I'm happy that my colleagues up here have talked about the power of amicus briefs and multi-state comment letters when we see cases being filed across the country. It's just like what uh, Don had mentioned in his remarks. You know, it's. Uh, don't take comfort when it's not your turn because your turn will come around. And so these efforts are helpful because other states that are grappling with some of these issues, we can say in California, we have an interest in this issue as well because this has been our experience and why we think it's important. And the courts can be persuaded by the real lived experiences um, of other states. Um, building coalitions with uh, external stakeholders, and, and, and my colleague Mahin is here, who's with our Office of Care, and that's precisely what that's intended to do. We become aware of issues uh, because of the work that external stakeholders are doing. Um, Elizabeth is very humble, but you know the, a big part of the apology that our office issued is because Elizabeth and her advocacy and bringing this to our attention and, and, and really conveying why it was so important. And of course, it was a no-brainer to do it, but it's working with folks who can understand how communities are impacted that can drive and direct the work um, that we're doing to, again, re-enfranchise those that have had that agency taken from them at some point. And so uh, the game of whack-a-mole is something that we're very familiar with, unfortunately, in the department. I would say right now, one of the largest uh, and most significant and concerted efforts that we're battling are the issues of LGBTQ students on campuses who are being targeted, uh, forced outing policies that are being promulgated by local school boards, within, which is the new repository of power. Uh, because there are essentially no <laughs> conditions for qualification. Anyone can do it, and that's a way to put forth an agenda locally that has great and broad significant impact. And so school districts all over California are popping up with policies that target gender nonconforming and trans students. It is a problem. It is a huge issue statewide. And again, it is an effort to undermine the diversity in this country, in this state, to disenfranchise and, 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 and harm uh, individuals and their liberties to be able to, to, to have an education, <laughs> something as simple as going to school and being able to learn uh, without fear of uh, physical or emotional, psychological abuse. Um, that's what we're fighting for. Um, and so we will continue uh, to do that. Uh, we will continue to look at how things impact people through systems. Um, there's a statement that has sort of been weaponized, and that is uh, uh, to, that being woke is, is a bad thing. And, and, and those who don't like the word woke sometimes have a hard time defining what they understand it to be. But uh, being woke uh, takes its roots in uh, slavery, uh, where our original police forces were actually slave patrols. Uh, that's uh, how policing came to be. And uh, slaves would tell each other to stay woke, to stay vigilant, to be eyeful and careful of what was going on around them. And so we all should be woke because, again, no one is exempt. And it does take coalition building. It takes allyship. It takes partnership with government agencies, with stakeholders and, and advocates and leaders to be vigilant because a lot of these laws are veily, uh, you know, they're covert in the way that they are written. They, their application extends far beyond what some would say is the intent behind uh, the legislation or the law. And if we're not woke and vigilant and, and paying attention, our civil liberties can be taken from us 
in an instant. No one who's had them taken from them saw it coming. Uh, and so we do need to be vigilant and we need to be supportive of each other. Here we go. I actually remember a few things from law school. It was a long time ago, but it, I was impressed by something that my, one of my con law professors said, which is test cases are brought by someone whose ox has been gored. And Damon, you said in our prep Zoom that uh, what impacts one impacts us all. And so I have thought about that phrase about an, an, an ox being gored that uh, we are sharing in all of our oxes being gored <laughs> at, at this moment. And Lisa, you wear many hats in the community. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so you're going to give us some of the some more plays in the playbook in terms of what we can do uh, in the community and as part of organizations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I realized as I'm sitting here, I'm I think the only non-lawyer who is really going to be speaking today. So <laughs> I don't know if that's a <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm also not a historian, although I spend a lot of time thinking about the past. Um, so I just wanted to start by uh, picking up on, on something we heard earlier about um, Attorney General Bonta visiting the Irecho across the plaza earlier today. Um, and I've been thinking both as a scholar and as a person about what Ide in, in the Irecho means. Um, and uh, Reverend Dr. Duncan Williams, who created it, you know, I think it's both him as a historian, but also as a Buddhist minister, thinking about Ide as a practice of soul consoling. And so you may have heard of the word Ide in the context of the white obelisk at Manzanar, the Irecho. Um, and I, I think about what it means to enact this practice of taking care of the souls of the dead, which I think is the most traditional interpretation of Ide. But I also think that there's a valence of Ide in terms of taking care, the, taking care of the souls of the living and even taking care of the souls of generations to come. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of two things that both Sudu for Solidarity and JACL um, at the national level and chapters um, have been focusing on, but also that many other Japanese American organizations have been involved with. Um, there are many people in this room who've been deeply involved in them. Um, I can't see very well, but, you know, I want to name Josh and Mark and Kathy and many, many others who, who are also thinking about these kinds of works in their own community organizing. Um, I'll start by talking a little bit about reparations, which is something we've talked about several times today already. In 2021, Sudu was asked by several national Black-led reparations organizations and the ACLU to solicit testimony from the Japanese American community in support of HR 40, which is a piece of federal legislation to do a, a federal study on the history and legacy of, of slavery and sort of a, a study bill about reparations that was mirrored in AB 3121. Um, and it made it to the House Judiciary Committee, which is the farthest it had ever made it in its um, nearly 40 years of being introduced on the House floor. Um, and as I think Don articulated so well, you know, this was, I think, an easy ask in many ways for Japanese Americans to speak out in support of this piece of legislation. And very quickly, we got over 300 letters of testimony in support. Um, and Kathy spoke in front of the committee on Zoom during the pandemic really, I think, gave voice to Japanese Americans and, and why people are speaking out and, and writing these testimonies. And I also think that process of giving testimony, whether it was in favor of H.R. 40, whether it was in the process of the AB 3121 um, commission meetings, um, mirrors the 1982 process for Japanese Americans to testify at the Commission on Wartime Internment and Relocation of Civilians. To me, as someone who grew up only in the aftermath of those hearings, I see them as really pathbreaking in the process of giving voice to community members and allowing people to speak their own truth publicly and really changing the trajectory and knowledge of the broader Japanese American community about what it means to speak up and what it means to speak out. And I'm grateful to be able to inherit those testimonies, both from the 80s and from the 2020s from community members who are sort of speaking about the incredible importance um, of, of their own voices. 
I think a lot about the word repair in reparations and what does it mean for us to repair? What does it mean for us to repair through legislation, which I think has its place and has its purpose, but also for us to repair as a community? And I think a, lo a lot about Japanese Americans today, you know, you hear often the phrases intergenerational trauma and intergenerational healing. And I think about this acts of repair as this process of healing multi-generationally from a collective community harm. And I think for me, a lot of that comes from acting in solidarity with other communities. And so in the testimonies that we received in 2021, I see so many of those as testimonies of repair, to be able to speak out for another community, to be able to say that these all of these histories are deeply intertwined, um, is an act of repairing ourselves as Japanese Americans, our community, our families, um, through the act of giving testimony. And so I'll use that to sort of talk about sort of the second area where, where Sudu and JACL and other organizations have been doing a lot of work, which is around immigration detention. A week ago, I was in Seattle with some members of Tsudu who were blockading the entrance to the Seattle Federal Building to demand the closure of Northwest Detention Center, which is the largest ICE detention facility in the Pacific Northwest. Some of the folks who were, who were blockading the doors took turns to sort of speak about why they were there. And my friends Stan and Barbara and Becca all talked about members of their family who'd been incarcerated. They talked about a brother David, an uncle Min, a grandmother Nobu, and what it meant for them to be removed from their homes and their communities and indefinitely detained, much like the people who are being held inside Northwest Detention Center today. Um, it was also close, Northwest Detention Center is physically close to the Puyallup Assembly Center, which was one of the, the first detention sites for Japanese Americans, particularly those from the Seattle community. But they also talked about their children and their grandchildren and sort of future generations of Japanese Americans. And their speaking out was not just for those who'd come before, but it was for those who are growing up now um, and wanting them to live in a world where there is less detention, where there is the possibility that they won't have to protest these kinds of sites. And I think it's easy to sort of see the connection to uh, the forced removal and mass incarceration of Japanese Americans. But I think this sort of putting it in this context of this broader history of white supremacy as well is important to see that this is also a history of um, border patrol. And, and the very first form of border patrol in the United States was policing the US-Canada border for Chinese immigrants. And the first forms of immigration restriction were put in place uh, for Chinese and then Japanese immigrants to the United States. And so this has this long history of being turned against whichever community is sort of the du jour community to target. And I want to sort of conclude with this notion that I think many people have raised of national security. Um, it's also, I think, important to, to see how national security gets invoked in the, the context of Japanese Americans, in the context of post 9-11 and uh, uh, using it against Muslim Americans, and today against new immigrant communities and a long-standing Chinese immigrant community in the United States. Um, national security, I think, is often a sort of mis misnomer. Um, and it's really about securing a nation, an image of a nation, a perception of a nation that, as so many of my fellow panelists have said, is really rooted in this ideology of white supremacy. Um, and so, you know, I think that these are some of the things that motivate our work today. And I think this motivation, you know, is not only sort of political in its purpose and political in its intentions and impacts, but I think ultimately is a project of healing and repair um, that is healing for communities beyond the Japanese American community and is also deeply healing within the Japanese American community. So let's talk about what we uh, have learned from the Trump versus Hawaii case and what is our state of unfettered executive power to invoke national security uh, in justification for uh, unconstitutional uh, restrictions or application against uh, individuals based on race, uh, national uh, identity, heritage, um, religion, et, et cetera. So we've seen a pattern of a geopolitical uh, 
politi the geop geopolitics affecting our domestic issues and having ramifications for the communities of uh, that perceived threat or um, aggression. Uh, so what have we learned from this pattern? How could we be better prepared for what the, uh, to the whack-a-mole? Uh, how can we be prepared for the next mole? Anybody? Uh, I know uh, one of the trends that we have paid attention to uh, at the Department of Justice is the correlation between world events and increases in hate crimes. Um, we've seen at every juncture where there's been a significant international event that crimes targeting individuals who belong to the group to which is being blamed for that international event skyrocket here. We saw it in 9-11 with Muslims and Arabs. Uh, we saw it again on October 7th with Muslims and Arabs um, and have seen it proliferate uh, with COVID-19 and, and, and the anti-Asian hate that uh, experienced you know, over a 200% increase in a year. Um, and so we see how fear and xenophobia drives individuals to commit crimes um, in the name of their own self-preservation. So kind of the same idea of national security when those who are claiming that they're taking actions for to make the nation safer and more secure are actually creating insecurity and instability in communities. Um, and so uh, really uh, working together to equip people and communities with this data, with this information, uh, so that they can see what the resources are available to communities to really sort of um, uh, guard themselves um, and be aware um, of the way that these uh, these trends tend to work and to require systems that are put in place for protection to do what's necessary uh, to protect uh, these communities, to make sure that the legal system uh, is working and holding uh, individuals and systems accountable. Thank you, and, and Clay, um, you, we were talking in the prep about uh, the need to have community organizations and solidarity uh, that got formed in response, but the, perhaps you and Lisa might talk about the importance of having the coalitions to begin with. Yeah, uh, it takes a whole village to get this done. Um, one of the hardest things when I started the WeChat case four years ago, was finding a wooden plaintiff mm -hmm. because we're still the president. Um, the Chinese American people are afraid of going against you know the highest official in this country. Um, I spent almost two weeks talking to dozens of people, trying to convince them. People say this is normal to say he's the president. <laughs> um, he will not be sent to jail or get you know. Uh, any mysterious mis mis disappearing like what's happening in China, so uh, where I came from. Um, when I was most desperate, I was talking to my wife saying, I might need you to be appointed. <laughs> uh, fortunately, uh, I was able to uh, convince and talk to several of uh, my friends and be able to join the lawsuit. Uh, four years later, uh, when when we started the uh, Indian landmark case in Florida, uh, the Chinese American communities quickly mobilized and organized themselves. Uh, with their help, I was able to get uh, almost 2,000 of leads of people who were willing to become planted within 24 hours. Wow. Uh, that shows, gives, gives me optimism in this country, saying people are waking up, people are caring about their rights because they feel being threatened. So um, with all the help from like organizations like ACLU, C100, and all the other nonprofit organizations, um, I think it is really important to find allies in this movement. Uh, in, the, in Texas, for example, last year when the state legislatures were proposing an alien land mobile, um, hundreds of people were going to Austin for testimony, including, I believe, three Japanese American people talking about how their families suffer during World War II. Yeah, and I think one, um, you know, 
Clay, earlier you talked about, you know, becoming a U.S. citizen and thinking that it would sort of have all these protections. Um, and I, you know, I think there are many mythologies about about America, some of which we've sort of addressed already. Um, and I think one of them is this notion, particularly for Asian Americans, that if we if we embrace the model minority, that there will be safety in that. And I see that as a really harmful idea about sort of what keeps us safe in this country and how we can be safe. Um, and I think there's a very real history of um, anti-Black racism within the Asian American community. But I think one of the things that that narrative also does is further divide communities from each other and, and keep people from having meaningful collaborations and, collab and allyship. Um, and so I would just really echo um, what you're saying that I think it's important to organize from the basis of, of relationship, um, from seeing that you know our liberations are bound up within each other's, um, and that the myths that drive us apart are are in order to keep power in the hands of very few people, and and we can hold a lot more power when we can work together. Don't let them divide and conquer us. Yeah, Jack, you and I work with students, um, and one of the things that uh, of course, uh, Attorney General Bonta mentioned the danger of apathy. And uh, do you hear about a sense of helplessness, hopelessness? Uh, our country has reached the point of dysfunctionality that we're just going to go off the cliff and there isn't anything we can do about it. Um, do you have a reaction to that What or the others in terms of how do we how do we combat this sense of apathy or cynicism, um, a lack of belief now in the integrity of our, of our, of our um, government institutions? Well, law students are energetic. Law students are optimistic. They are hoping that um, they'll be able to make a difference in the world in their careers. And so I don't see among my students a, a uh, a, a sense of apathy, but it, it's not a random sample of, of people of that age or students or anything like that. I, I am concerned um, that that people will not realize the seriousness of the moment that we're in and the importance of uh, of uh, voting and uh, letting our voices be heard. I, you know, I, it, it's not clear to me that. That um, the our, our our system of democracy. Anybody who's studied the Constitution and its interpretation and application over the years r realizes that there's a lot of play in the joints and a lot of opportunities for bad things to happen. And I'm not sure that. Um, that we could stand a, a real hard test uh, again. Lisa, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I again, I, I don't think I, I'm used to, a, or I don't think I work with a random sample of young people, um, but I think that there are many, many very politically engaged young people in the Japanese American community um, across the country um, who I think are really imagining a future that I'll say for myself, you know, five, 10 years ago, I didn't think was possible um, and are really pushing me to think much more imaginatively, capaciously about what the future of the Japanese American community can be. And that really excites me. Damon, anything you want to? To that. Um, no, but I, I just briefly the I, I think there is a uh, a sense of how young people are engaging now that is much different uh, than what we're used to seeing, and people sometimes see that as apathy. Uh, when I have seen uh, you know signs that uh, young people are very engaged, very aware, um, I, I'm more concerned about older generations, quite frankly, in terms of the direction uh, of the country and, and, and people not falling prey to the same types of things that we've seen in the past. I, I do think that the young folks really know what's going on. And um, I think when the, when the time comes, they'll be engaged. But again, the examples that are set, I think, by 
other generations is really critical um, and they are watching and they are listening. Um, I can say when we talked about solidarity a little bit um, and Don touched on this a little bit, one of the most compelling and powerful hearings that we had during the reparations task force meeting was when the Japanese uh, reparations experience came to life in the hearing and those that had advocated for Japanese reparations came and you would have thought at many moments that we were at a Rams game, uh, a, a Laker game. I mean, the the sense of appreciation for even coming and sharing that experience was one thing. The powerful stories that were being told was another. Uh, but there were young people there um, in that hearing who were surprised to have seen Japanese people coming to a hearing about black reparations. And of course, of an older generation to be able to talk firsthand about the things that they experienced. And it really invoked a sense of admiration and inspiration. And it doesn't matter what you look like, those who are engaged in the justice movement are being watched and emulated, I think, strongly by the younger generation. Yeah, and in the work that I've been doing over the past uh, years, I just come away with even more respect and appreciation and gratitude to my parents, um, their generation, the Nisei, the, my grandparents, the Issei, uh, just unfathomable uh, hardship and dis hard decisions that, 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 that those two generations had to make and, and the gratitude for the sacrifices that they, that they made for the opportunities that we have and, and the stewardship that I think we feel now. Um, to to honor that legacy. Um, to wrap up, uh, how about if I invite each of you to give one word? I'm taking this out of uh, something that Elizabeth had us do um, in, at the start of uh, our preparation. Uh, one word that you might like to leave as a, as a charge or, or uh, uh, inspiration for the, for the group. I, Clay, I know what your word was. Uh, my word is during the Zoom meeting was fun. I'll keep using the same word. I might end where I started with Ire and ask you to think about what it means to you to console the souls of the dead, to console yourself, and to console the souls of generations to come. I think my word would be allyship, uh, just because I see the critical importance in the work that I do every day, uh, internally within our department, externally in the world, and even in between, and how things happen when people stick together. I'm going to say work, uh, and that people should do what they can do, given their situation and their circumstances and their interests um, and and contribute to the cause of justice uh, 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 however they can. So I'll, I'll tag on with action to to do whatever the work is to, to, but to do something so well thank you all I think uh, we've uh, had a wonderful discussion and it's been um, an honor I think I could speak for all of us to be part of this occasion and uh, I think I'll turn it back over to Amy, to Matt. <laughs> well, first off, thank you to all of our wonderful speakers. And hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Wisely. I'm one of the youths. Uh, and I'm also Education Programs Manager for the Japanese American Citizens League National. I also served as one of the volunteers who worked to make today possible, and I promise I'm the last speaker. <laughs> but behalf of, on behalf of all of us, we want to thank you for joining us today for this historic event. As a descendant of the incarceration, where my grandfather at age seven and his family were forcibly removed from their home in Northern California and sent to the deserts of Arizona, the apology by Attorney General Bonta and his team means a great deal to me as it does to many others within our community. And as we reflect on what we've heard today, it makes me think of a conversation I just had a few days ago. 
I was interviewed by two elementary school students, 10, 10 years old, uh, from New York, and they were doing a report on the history of Japanese American incarceration. As we were talking, their teacher asked me a follow-up question. He had asked if I thought that the apology and the reparations that we, our community had gained under the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was enough to make up for what had happened during the war. And as I reflected on his question, I thought about remarks I had made just across the plaza a week ago during our Day of Remembrance program. I had said that all we see here today, everything that our community is and will be, has been shaped by those years of incarceration and the stories of resistance, bravery, and despair that came with it. So how could an apology and a check for $20,000 ever be enough to make up for what happened? Well, I think we all know that it can't be. There will never come a time where we can say that anything has made up for what happened to our community during the war. We will never get back the time we lost, the property, the money, language, people, culture, and history, and so much more. It's all gone forever. But as Don and Bill and so many others have said that the redress movement wasn't about gaining back what we had lost. The redress movement and other acts like the Attorney General's apology are about vindication and about healing. These acts help to prove to the rest of the world what our community has known all along, that the incarceration in every facet was wrong. And not only was it wrong, it was the result of racism, wartime hysteria, and a failure of our political system. Not the military necessity, not the national security that the army, the government, and so many others have parroted over the years, even after the war has ended. So we stand here today because of General Bonta and his team for recognizing that what our community went through was wrong and that governmental bodies like his office were wrong for supporting such actions. But as you've heard also from our panelists, there's still much work that needs to be done. And as we come to the end of our time here today, we invite everyone to join us across the way for a reception and light refreshments. So once again, let me thank all of our volunteers and thank you to Ann Burroughs and the Janum staff for hosting us. Thank you to our speakers, Amy Watanabe, Susan Kamei, Damon Brown, Jack Chin, Lisa Doy, and Clay Zhu. And once again, thank you to our Attorney General Bonta and his team for all of their hard work and for all of you for joining us today. Please enjoy. <laughs>